Okay. All right, so let's learn. Yeah, All right, so um, all right, so so Wednesday nights with Derek Klal again. You know, I'm sure all of you know this already by now, but uh, Wednesday nights, what we tried, to, what we've been trying to do, is sort of take a safer, one of the classics far from the Talmud of Hashem, and usually what, we're, what I'm going to try to do is take a take a safer that for the most part. Um, it's hard to necessarily find like a certain theme or uh, a certain hashkafa soil on the worldview in it, but try to uh, try to find one. You know, so the first safer we did, and we spent a long time on it, was the Talmud Yaakov Yosef. Now, what was amazing about that safer is that it wasn't a specific um, sort of aspect of Chassidus. Since since Toldos Yaakov Yosef was the first Chassidish Sefer of all time, written by one of the greatest students of Baal Shem Tev, in Toldos Yaakov Yosef were sort of the beginnings of all of Tars of Baal Tev, and all the different uh, styles of Chassidus and so on are ultimately rooted in a lot of the foundational concepts that we went through with Toldos Yaakov Yosef. <clears throat> so what I want to do just sort of to contrast that, because that was just so sort of broad and open-ended in nature, I want to go opposite now. I want to go now to focus on uh, Sefer, which is very specific in its style. All, again, part of the general concept of what Chassidus is about, but very specific in how this particular Sefer takes that light of the Baal Shem Tev and directs it in a particular corner of the Hashem. And so when I was thinking about what Sefer to pick, I was also trying to think about like the time of year that we're in, which is now we're entering into the whole Purim, Indian, you know, the time of Purim and so on. And to me, if there's one branch of Chassidus, which is Malamish Purimdik, everything's been a hapechu, it's Ishbitsa, that's the way it is. So that's what I want to do. So for the next little bit, we'll, we'll go into the world of Ishbitz and Ishbitz Razin, but specifically, there's a lot of Svarim in that world, but I want to focus specifically on just the Sefer Meishalach, which is uh, the origin of that whole dynasty, where Marech is a Vishbitz and Meishalach. So I was like this. I, personally, I, I struggle with beginning like these series is or any like I begin I have a struggle in the beginning because I you know I, I want to like get all in and the truth is I should probably take it slow and and give a few sheer I like the history of it and all that stuff I, I, I have a hard time with that I just want to like you know we don't have a lot of time before Mashiach comes you have to just do it you know what I mean so so let me give you a little bit of just a little bit of a historical picture of, of who the Shvitzer was tonight it, we're not going to be learning really anything from the actual Sefer Meishalach tonight I just want to give a general picture a little bit of what Ishbitz Chassidus is really about. This is a topic that I spoke about when we had Shabbos Ishbitz, was it before Hanukkah? So um, what I spoke about by the Tish Friday night, there's going to be more things tonight, Bez Hashem, hopefully to fill in a few gaps, but it'll be a little bit of what, what not a little bit, it'll be that Indian that I spoke about that Tish Friday night. So those that were there and have a good memory, again, it's Chazara, but with additions. Those that weren't there, so, uh, okay, here we go. So it's like this. So who, who was the more, who was the Ishbitz? The Mordechai is the Ishbitz. So he was a, again, it's a lot, of, a lot of history to it, but he was coming from the base measure, from the, from the, the Chatzar of the Kotzker. Right? Everyone's heard of the Kotzker, Mendel of Kotzker. So the Kotzker Rebbe coming from that world of Pshischa. So Mendel Kotzker was the Rebbe and his greatest Disciple slash colleague was Ramar of Vishwas. Okay, now it, it's well known. It's well known that the Kutzker was. It, he goes on history as someone that's absolute discerning truth. Truth Kutzker Emes, 
black and white. If it's not 100% MS, it's 100% Shaker. The Kotzka was very, very strong. So much so that it was well known that even to be in the presence of the Kotzka was not so posh. Uh, to be a Kotzka chassid was not so posh. Even if you were allowed into that base measure for the Kotzka to pay attention to you in a positive way, it was not so posh. And so, practically speaking, the way it worked in Kotzk was that you know, those younger chassidim that would come to learn the ways of Kotzk, the way of the way of Chassidus, the way of the Baal Shem, the way of Vayetz uh, Hashem, so they weren't allowed into the Shir the Kotzke right away. It would be after years. Lemaisa, the one that was in charge of actually really cultivating and bringing up Chassidim and teaching them the ways of Vayetz Hashem, was the Ishbitzer, was the Marches of Ishbitz. Now, the Ishbitzer was there for many years, but all that during that time, he was ultimately the one that was much more hands on involved with Chassidim. With the younger Hasidim, especially, he was hands-on involved with them. They looked at him as really their as really their Rebbe. The Kotzker was the was the Rebbe, but ultimately the Ishvitzer was the one that was more hands-on in terms of teaching and uh, bringing them up and introducing the Hasidim to the ways of what the Sashem of the Baal Shem does. Now the specific now the, the specific story that I want to focus on tonight that we're gonna sort of use as a way to a little bit understand what Ishbitz Chassidus is about and the Sefer Meir Shilech was the famous Maisa of, of when the Ishbitzer decided to split from the Kutzker and to start his own Chassidus. Okay. <laughs> now, <laughs> the, the Maisa goes like this, that it was during Simchas Torah, okay, it was during, during Simchas Torah that particular year, and the kids and Nimrus, what happened was, usually by Simchas Torah, so the Rumerich Yosef, his name was Mordechai Yosef, and he would get the covet of dancing with the Torah in the middle by the sixth Hakafim. Okay. Now that particular year, the Ishritzer was staying in a particular hotel in the area, and Ishritzer said the following thing, that it was Nizgala to him, Minas Shemayim. It was revealed to Minas Shemayim that that Simchas Torah, that day, he has to officially break off and start his own Chesidus. What was the Simen? So the Ishritzer said the Simen Minas Shemayim was is that that morning of Simchas, that that morning of uh, of Simchas Torah when he uh, when he woke up and he put his shoes on, he accidentally put on his 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 uh, left shoe first. He put on his left shoe first. You don't know halacha. You're supposed to put your right shoe on first. The fact that he put his left shoe on first, it was a simit to him that 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 means he has to break off and become his own rabbi and start the dynasty of Ishmael Tzadzin. Okay. So that's what he does. So he sends a message that he's going to make his own akafas in the hotel. Now, meanwhile, at this time, a little bit of the background, not only was the Kutzker always very, very stark and always very difficult to have a personal connection with, but during that time, that was during those years of seclusion. It was well known that during that whole Tukufa for years, the Kutzker literally locked himself off in his office, and under only the rarest of occasions would he come out and actually talk to the chassidim. So during those years, the Derech Klal, the Ishbitzer, had a strong following amongst the young Hasidim because he was the one that introduced them to the way of Hasidus. But especially those years where the Kutzker was nowhere to be seen, so for sure the, the Ishbitzer was basically fearing Tish. Not only that, it's also well known that he started actually taking Kfitlach. You know, when the Hasidim would come and give their name, it was, you know, that's why I mentioned that uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a thing that they have, the tradition we have from the Shem Shmuel. Sachet Shav Rebbe, so the Sachet Shav Rebbe, Shemish Shmuel, once asked his father, the Avnei Nezer, who was one of the Chesidim over there in Kotzk, and he asked his father, why is it that when the Ishbitzer started taking names to give brachas, which is a Rebbe should think to do, under the nose of the Kotzker, why isn't that none of the Chesidim said anything? Like, you should have, like, uh, that's, 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 that's rebellious, that's, uh, that itself is, is, is Merba Malchus, you know? <laughs> so the Avnei Nezer said that in Kotzk, Emes is so, is so important that none of the chassidim said anything to the Ishbitzer because every single one of us was afraid that maybe there's a part of us that would that that wants to say something because of our own personal jealousy because the Ishbitzer was so great maybe we're a little bit jealous of him that he's that he's taking kvitlach and we're not so because there might have been that slight possibility in our hearts don't say anything that's what we're talking we're talking about big tzaddikim so anyway so at that time the Ishbitzer sends a message Mila Shem Eli we're making our coffee in the in the hotel. <laughs> And the Maisa goes is that during that, that Simchas Torah, so there was tons and tons of people, especially the younger Chassidim, by the Ishritzer doing Hakafis. Now, meanwhile, in, in the main base manager in Kotz, so the, 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 the Kotzker was again in seclusion. But when it came time for the sixth Hakafa, so the Ishritzer wasn't there. 
So they gave us they gave covet to someone else. So this other person, I'm sure Khashviyad, was dancing in the middle of the Sefer Torah. Meanwhile, his six hakafa happens, the Kutzker runs out of his closet and runs to the middle and just sees a person there with the talus over his head holding his Sefer Torah, and he grabs the talus away from him. Now then the person like you know, picked up his talus, what's going on, and the Kutzker realized that it wasn't the Ishbitz. In other words, the Kutzker knew what was going on, and his intention was, by that Simchas Torah, to make this public statement of conflict between him and the Ishbitzer. And the Ishbitzer, not being there, avoided that public confrontation. But that was really the moment of splitting between the Ishbitzer and Kutz. So this is what we're going to try to figure out tonight. This specific Indian of the Kutzker and Ishbitzer splitting off Davka by Simchas Torah, and Davka the Simen of the Ishbitzer putting on his left shoe first. What's the Hashgacha practice in that? What does this tell us about Ishbitz, about Kutzk? Okay, that's what we're going to be learning about tonight. And and what exactly, what is Ishbitz Chassidus about? Again, for many of you, this is, uh, you know what Ishbitz is about, but uh, we'll see. So let, let, let's connect this sugya to something that's going on in these parshas. Okay, so take a look at Marmokka number one. <coughs> okay, there's a Gemara Brachas. It's a well-known Gemara. Nunheim et Alf. Okay, we know that, uh, again, uh, this past parsha, this week's parsha, mm-hmm. the next couple parshas, it's all about the building of the Mishkan. Yeah? Building of the Mishkan. So, <clears throat> so the way the order of the parshas are, as we know, is that parsha's true. My last week's parsha, the Rabbani Shalom tells Moshe Rabbeinu about building the uh, vessels of Mishkan, building the structure itself. This week's parsha is about the Godim, the Begdei Kuna. And then Moshe Rabbeinu is told that Betzal, the Nor Ben Chur, right? Betzal is the project manager, and he's going to be the one taking care of the Mishkan. So the Gemara says in Brachas a famous conversation between Moshe and Betzal. Om Rabbi Yonason, Rabbi Yonason said, Betzal al Shem Chachmosoi Nikra. Betzal was named Betzal with Ruch HaKadosh, his parents named him that. And his name is indicative of the Chachma that he had. What, what's the Chachma? So So when the Rabbi Shalom said to, told Moshe Rabbeinu, Lech emor loy lebetzala, aseli mishkan aren v'kelem. So the Rabbi Shalom gives Moshe Rabbeinu the instruction, go tell betzala that he should make the mishkan, the aren, and all the vessels. Okay, that's the that that was the message. Halach Moshe. So Moshe goes v'hafach and changes the order to betzala. V'amr and he says, asay aren v'kelem u'mishkan. Build the aren, the kelem, and then the mishkan. Um, so that's what he does. Um, so Betzal responds to Moshe Rabbeinu. He says, you know, Rabbeinu, Min Oilam, the minig of the world is, what's normal is, Adam Bain Abayas. First you build the structure. And then you, build, then you bring the vessels in. But you, but you told me just now, right, that first I should build the vessels and then I should build the structure. Kalem shani oisel hechen echnisam. So when I build the kalem first, where am I supposed to house them? Doesn't it make sense to build the structure first, and then the house, and then the and then the kalem? So kach amalach amalach hakadosh baruch hu. Maybe 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 shema kach amalach. Maybe this is what the rabbanu shem told. It's an interesting thing. But Sal says maybe this is what the rabbanu shem said to you. I say mishkan arve kalem. Think about this, Moshe. Maybe maybe got the order reversed. Maybe he messed up a little bit. Chas v'shalom. Maybe the rabbanu shem really said mishkan and then arve kalem. Amr Loi, and Moshe then says, oh, Yitaka, right. Shema b'tzel kele yisa v'yadata. So I, uh, maybe you were sitting in the shade of that conversation, and you overheard really what the truth was, and you're right. Rabbanu Shantaka said, Mishkan and then Kele. Okay. That's why he's called b'tzel the, in the shade of Hashem, as if he was like listening on to that secret conversation, and he remembered better what the conversation was like than Moshe Rabbeinu. Okay, a few obvious questions. First of all, Chal, Moshe Rabbeinu just uh, forgot the order. The, the whole thing that Moshe Rabbeinu should make a mistake like that is a pella, number one. Number two, the truth is in Parshas Truma, where we have recorded how the Rabbanu Shalom told Moshe Rabbeinu, the order is, as we know, Taka Kalim, and then Mishka. Moshe is right. So it must be like, so there's this funny thing. So it must be putting it together is that Taka, when the Rabbanu Shalom told Moshe Rabbeinu initially about the Mishkan, in that private conversation of Parshas Truma, it was Taka Kalim and then Mishka. All of a sudden, when the Rabbani Shalom then tells Moshe Rabbeinu, okay, now that I told all of that to you, now go and instruct B'Tzalel, the Rabbani Shalom switches it and says Mishkan and then Kalim. But Moshe Rabbeinu is still holding on to how it was described in Parshish Truma, which is Kalim and then Mishkan. 
And then Betzal is saying, but no, maybe the Rabbanu Shalom switched the order on you. So like, so th- th- this whole thing is strange. Why is the Rabbanu Shalom switching the order constantly? So if the, if Taka, the, the Mahalach, should be Mishkan and then Kalim, that's how the, it should be given over in Parshish Shuma. In Parshish Shuma, it's given over how Moshe Rabbeinu thought he heard, right? And then all of a sudden, the Rabbanu Shalom Taka switched it in terms of actually telling Betzal. So how do we make sense of that? And finally, another thing that's funny is, maybe we'll see if you have time to answer this final question, is that why is everyone talking Shema? Why is everyone saying, we're not maybe? Like, Betzal says, maybe the Rabbanu Shalom said in a different order. And Moshe says, okay, maybe you were, you were sitting in the shade. Why, why all the Shemas? Why, why the Shemas? Why not? Betzal should say, you know, the Mechil is quite Harav. The Rabbanu Shalom must have said in the opposite order. And Moshe Rabbanu should respond, okay, you're right. You were sitting in the shade. What do you mean? Shema. Why all the shemas? Okay. Fine. <clears throat> okay, so what's the issue with Hasidus Adat? So, you know, the, the way I like to say it is that, you know, all of, all of Tars of Al-Shamtav, this is something we spoke a lot about, about a lot about in, in on, under the, the Sefer of the Teltas Yaakov Yosef in all different ways. But what Taras HaChasidus is, what the Baal Shem Tev did, was to reintroduce the world, we'll put it this way, to reintroduce the world and reintroduce the Jew to, to how the world exists and, and who the Jew is before there was a world and before there was a Jew. That's really what Chasidus is, what I mean. So we spoke about this with Talas Yaakov Yosef, is that there's who you are down here. There's what the world is down here. But there's who you are and the, who, there's who the world is as it was thought of in God's mind. And what Taras Chasidis is, is about introducing us to that God of Kaidim Shnevra Ayla, the God, who God is before he began this, before he constricted himself in this finite world. Chasidis is about reintroducing the world to what the world was when it was still in God's thought. It's about reintroducing the Jew to who you are as you existed in God's thought before you were constricted into being just a simple limited human being. That's that's what Tarz Chasidus really is. Now that idea of of re of 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 God, the world and the Jew and Torah, all in its primordial state. All, all in its pre-constricted state. That's really the Gilead of the Baal Shem Tev. Baal Shem Tev gives us the ability to perceive God, perceive the world, to perceive ourselves, to perceive Torah, as all those things existed before they were constricted in the forms that we have now, that we think of now. That's what Tarsus Chassidus We wouldn't be able to perceive ourselves before, as uh, you know, as we exist in the thought of Hashem. Those areas would be unknowable, unrelatable, untouchable. The chiddush the Baal Shem Tev is that that our entire existence should no longer be oriented to what the world is after creation. Rather, our orientation should be what the world is as it exists pre-creation, and what a Jew is before you were born what the Torah is before it comes down to planet Earth. It's all, it's all that our consciousness should be not, like we say in davening every single day, God, you exist before creation and after creation. So which God, Kiviachal, is the focal point of our Avodah Hashem? What side of reality is our, is our, is our, fundam- is our core consciousness revolving around? The gracious and on, in terms of God, in terms of creation, in terms of the world, in terms of Tyre, in terms of the Jew, or is, all, or is it all pre bracious The Chiddush of the Baal Shem Tev is, is that all of our orientation has to be pre bracious Every single school of Hasidus is taking that idea and just f- focusing that light and that truth in particular different areas of, of, of life, particular different areas of the Hashem. So some, some schools of, 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 of the Baal Shem Tev will be Focusing that revelation of uh, of kaidem habria in davni, some chassidus will be focusing that light of pre-creation in 
in uh, in mitzvahs. Some chassidus will be focusing that light of pre of of uh, of God's mind of pre you know pre creation in terms of uh, learning Torah, thinking uh, you know of his bainunos. The Ishbitzer has a unique way of focusing that light of the Baal Shem Tov in those areas that are ugly. In those er- what happens when you take that light of what happens when you take that light of the Baal Shem Tov and you and you and you and you direct it towards all the areas of your life that you're not proud of? What happens then? What happens then? Because all sins, all mistakes, all regrets, all ugliness that we that we have that exist from Bracious and on, what happens when those dark spaces are, you know, what happens when the when the flashlight of the Baal goes to those areas? What happens then? That's what the Ishritz is about. That's what the Ishritz is about. And when we begin to appreciate what that means and what happens when the light of the Baal the light of, of Ad to Hu Ad Shaloi Nevro Oilam, the light of, of who you, the light of Torah as it exists, as it, before it was constricted in this world, when you focus that primordial light on areas of life that are completely broken, uh, then we're going to see that amazing things take place over there. And let's appreciate the the drastic contrast of that world of Ishbitz, as we'll see, with where he comes from, which is Kotsk. Kotsk is black and white. Black and white. Black and white. Right or wrong? And in Ishbitz, what we, what we see all the time is that when that primordial light of the Baal Shem Tov is focused on areas that are black, right, and those that are wrong, that are negative, that are, that are evil, all of a sudden, it's super confusing. It's not as evil as it looks. And so this is something that uh, we're going to have to make sense of. But tonight, just to introduce this idea of where Ishbitz Chassidus is really coming from, just as the, I think the, the, we're, we're going to learn a little a piece from the Kutamaran to uh, shed light on, on the subject. Yeah. Is Ishvitz a prat of the Baal Shem? Like, like we just described, right? We just mm-hmm. described Baal Shem to, yeah. but then it's not only this, you know, described as that's Ishvitz. So I think, yeah, I think Ishvitz yeah. is a prat. In other words, it's well, every single chatzar is taking that light and channeling it in different ways. So I'll give you an example. So in, in you know in, in Chabad Chasidus, that's a pretty uh, easy one to explain. Chabad Chasidus takes the light of the Balsham and focuses it in terms of of uh, in different ways. Let's say one way of his bindings, of literally contemplating and meditating on how the world, how the existence of the world from creation and on is is only a piece of a much larger story. And all of his all all Chabad Chasidus, the his bainunas, the contemplation, the meditation of Chabad Chasidus is how everything that you know of in this world, spiritual, physical and spiritual, is a, a ray of as a photon compared to the actual sun itself. So it's all about like having that sort of bringing your consciousness to that place of of zooming all the way out, of going all the way back before creation. Ishbitz is, is, but again, so so that's that's an example of. Of, fo- of focusing the light of the Baal Shem Tev in a particular way. And that's what Ishmael does as well, but in a, but in a different, in a different yeah. form. So it's different, uh, all these different uh, lenses mm-hmm. of taking that light and focusing in different places. Okay, let's let's take a look at, uh, at Marmokha number two. There's a piece from Lakut Maran and Simen Nun Vav, okay? In the Aleph, Simen Nun Vav. <clears throat> and let's appreciate what what what, what the Meishilach, what the... Um, who the Meishilach came to help? What people are, who, who are Ishbitz Chassidim? You know, let's put it that way. See, other schools of Chassidus, you have to be, um, other schools of Chassidus are, are, are some, some of them are very focused on, 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 on giving tools to tzaddikim to become even bigger tzaddikim, right? But but as we're going to see, Ishbitz is 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 trying to give the light of the Baal Tov to people that are stuck in very very ugly places. It's very similar to Breslov in that way. Breslov, in a certain sense, you can think of Breslov as the uh, like a, the weaponized version of Ishbitz. You know, it's like Ishbitz is talking about concepts that undermine the concept of giving up. 
And then Rabbi Nachman takes it and weaponizes it by screaming, <coughs> But why is there no such thing as giving up? Well, that you have to look in Ishmael to find out. So it's like the, the, a lot of the major philosophy of what Rabbi Nachman, they're like, Rabbi Nachman is the one that's literally going down and pulling, pulling you out again and by your pains. But what gives him the ability to do that is the philosophy that's spoken about by the Ishmael. So they, they, there's a, so in that sense, there's a very strong bond between Ishbitz and, and Breslov in that way. So this is a piece in the Kut Maran where were he's talking about this idea. Or, Say it again? Were they related in time and place? Or just well, I mean, uh, so. Rabbi Nachman was prior to the Ishbitzer in, ter- in terms of time. Uh, I mean, we're not talking about a huge time difference. You know, there's definitely an overlap, uh, you know, uh, but they weren't exactly the same time. But, um, but in terms of philosophy, you know, there's so a very strong bond. Well, I, well, well, I mean, Rabbi Nachman wouldn't have been familiar with Ishbitzer, right? But in terms of the Ishbitzer being familiar with Rabbi Nachman, I don't know about the Ishbitzer himself, but the great student of the Ishbitzer was Rabbi Sadek Akain of Ublin, and Rabbi Sadek was a great uh, admirer of Rabbi Nachman. He even had, wrote, uh, wrote notes on one of the Rabbi Nachman's farm. So that, that there was a strong connection between, the, between at least the Talmud of the Ishbitzer and Rabbi Nachman. But uh, it, it, it's very, very similar. And as they, 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 again, th- this is going to be the idea of, 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 of focusing the light of the Baal Shem Tev and revealing to us what the Torah looks like in that place of Kaidim Shinevra Oilam and how that relates to all those areas of our lives that we don't necessarily live up to what the Torah demands of us. Like, what happens then? So let, let, let's see. It'll, it'll, it'll become more clear. Take a look at my rock number two. Okay, we gotta, like, we gotta move. We gotta move. Okay, so it's like this. Kishnei mini has stars. Okay, we're gonna go through this a little bit quick. Kishnei mini has stars. Rabbi Nachman famously says in this piece, there are two levels of Hester Panim that a Jew can find themselves in. nister bahastar achas. The first level, when, uh, when the Rabbanu Shalom is hidden and concealed in the first level, so it's very hard to find Hashem when you're stuck in a place of concealment. But when it's only one layer of concealment, so you can dig, put some work, and you'll be able to find Hashem. Until you find Him. Why? Because the first level of concealment is a Jew that knows that God is hidden from them. The Jew knows that they're not in a bad place. So then you're really stuck. Then you're really stuck. So, what if the concealment that a person is in is itself concealed from you? Where the person himself doesn't even know, or she doesn't even know that God is concealed from that person, from that place. Then, then, it would seemingly be impossible to find Hashem from that place. Why? Because you don't even know what to look for. You don't even know what to look for. You don't even know, to you don't even know that there's a need to look. So how do you even begin? How do you even begin? This is why it's going to get to the porn. This is the, like the word Esther, Esther Malka. This is the meaning of the Pasuk. Hashem says, I will certainly conceal myself. The, the double ocean. I will conceal the concealment. That there's going to be a situation in life, God forbid, where the Jewish people or the individual Jew will find themselves in a place of concealment where they're not even the, the concealment is so deep that they don't, themselves don't even know that they're in a state of concealment. So he repeats that in that place, then you're not going to be able to find God. Since you don't know that there's that God's concealed, so what are you going to do? But now Rabbi Nachman explains, but he, the, and, and this, and again, to me, this is what the Meshulach is about. The Meshulach is, is, is about sending help, not to Jews that are in a state of Hester Panim. That you don't need Ishritzer for. The Ishritzer is here to give chiyas and to give hope, just like Rabbi Nachman, to give hope to those Jews that are in a state of concealment within concealment. So how do you, how do you fix that? Avul Bamas, but says Rabbi Nachman like this. The truth is, that even within all the concealment, and even in the concealment within the concealment, so the guy doesn't even know what, he's, what he doesn't know. The uh, song plays with these words a little bit. Uh, certainly, and this is going to be the key, 
The key is as follows, that in that place of Hester Panim, and even concealment within concealment, the Rabbana, you ha- every, God is there as well. God is there as well. And this is going to be the key. See, if God is, if you were to theoretically believe that God is not in that place of even concealment within concealment, and you have to leave that place to go somewhere else to discover the Rabbana Shalom, then you're stuck. Then you're stuck because there's nothing motivating you to leave that place. So the only way out is for someone from the outside, a tzaddik, to shed light on your situation and to reveal that literally where you are is also where God is. And you don't therefore have to go anywhere else to discover the Rabbana Shalom because he's literally the same environment that until now has been concealment within concealment. A tzaddik has to come and reveal that that environment itself is actually full of God's presence. How so? How does it work? So Rabbi Nachman explains. Because we know, and this is a basic principle, there is nothing that exists that's without, that's not being sustained by God's life force. It's not being sustained by His light. Without the Rabbi Shlomo's chiyas, think that nothing would exist. So physical objects wouldn't exist without God's presence, and emotional states, and and, 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 and mental constructs wouldn't exist without God's presence either. You wouldn't be able to be in any, even spiritual states that you find yourself in, whether it be high spiritual states or very low spiritual states. Any state of being cannot exist unless God is pumping life force into it. So objects only exist because God is pumping life force into it and, and, and levels and level, spiritual levels also only exist because God is pumping life into it, which means that being in the Kodesh HaKadshem is obviously an envi- a godly environment, because without God's presence in that environment, there would be no Kodesh HaKadshem. And as Rabbi Nachman writes in elsewhere, even the great city of Rome, which is the opposite of the Kodesh HaKadshem, also cannot exist without God's presence. That's true for physical places like the Kaddish HaKadshim versus Rome. And that's true for also mental states. Sometimes a person is in a spiritual place that's called Kaddish HaKadshim. And sometimes mentally and spiritually the person is in Rome. Those states of being as well are impossible to exist without God being the ultimate environment that those, that those places exist in. So Rabbi Nachman says like this, Val came, Bevade, so it must be, this is step one. That in every in every thing, every action, every thought, it must be that the Rabbana Shalom is in those thoughts. The Rabbana Shalom must be the universe within which that thought exists. Because otherwise, there is no thought. And this is the this is the kicker. That means that even when a person does an Avera, which is certainly not what God wants. We'll have to investigate that. Nevertheless, it must be that even in that negative, evil, destructive, spiritual state that a person finds themselves in by doing an Aveira, it must be that environment itself is also being sustained by God's presence. But obviously God's presence there is very concealed. But even concealment within concealment doesn't mean God's not there. If God wasn't there, then there would, there would be no place that was in a state of concealment within concealment. If it exists, if it exists mentally, spiritually, and physically, it means that that is a place that must be sustained by God. One second. That's number one. Now number two. Rabbi Nachman says, what is the vehicle through which God in, injects his energy into reality? So we have this idea, fine, this is principle number one. If something exists, it's because it's being sustained by God. What is the tool that God uses to inject his energy into reality? The answer is the Torah. Istakal barais of Ram. The Rabbanish looked in Torah and uses Torah to create the world. Torah is not simply the blueprint, as they always say. Torah is the vehicle, Torah is the conduit, it's the pipeline, it's the mechanism through which the Rabbani Shlolem infuses reality with existence. So now let's put these two principles together. If, number one, everything that exists, both in physicality and in 
headspace exists only because God is enlivening it with his energy, number one. And number two, the way in which God enlivens all things, physical and mental, is through Tyra. That means that, there's, that every single experience, every single moment, every single dimension, every single place that you're in emotionally and mentally, spiritually and physically, has to be sustained through Tyra. It means that that space, mentally, physically, v'chulu v'chulu, is being enlivened by a particular Pasuk and Chumash, by a particular passage of Tyra. So, because everything was created, everything is being sustained by God's presence, and the Torah is the vehicle through which God sustains it. So that means that Torah has to be contained in all things, and Torah is ultimately the battery and the source of life for all experiences. So he says like this, The Torah is in fact, therefore, and the, the life force of all things, Nimsa, so it comes out, In all things, in all actions, in all thoughts, even Averis, even negative thoughts, negative actions, negative words, Yeshom Gamken, his It must be that the Torah, that the that, that there's a Pasuk that's literally giving life to that particular moment, to that particular experience. What does that mean? How do I know? Which Pasuk? You know? So now Rabbi Nachman begins to introduce us to how this works. We know there's a famous teaching from the Ramban, and it goes back to Chazal, that the Torah that we have, the version of Torah that we have, is only the final version of Torah. But, the, the, but we know that famously, as the Ramban says, that the entire Torah that we have from Bracious all the way to the end is, in, in a certain sense, in a, exists on all levels, on, on much higher planes than than the Chumash that we have in our hands. Which means, in its highest state, the Torah is, as Ramban says, Tzirufei Shemesh Avishbaruchu, one long stream of divine names. And as the Torah descends from level to level, all the way making it down to planet Earth, then those letters, those stream of letters, which on its highest level is just all Elokus, all divinity, mm-hmm. all divine names, as it makes its way down to planet Earth, it it becomes malleable and it becomes broken up into all different layers, all different levels, until finally it descends into the final, more most practical version that we have right now. <clears throat> Which, but, but that means, but that means, and this is where Rinachim is coming from, is that any particular pasuk that 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 we have right now in Torah is only the final stage of a process that that pasuk went through from the beginning. All the way to the very end, and the very very beginning, that pasuk did not read as "Zacharis Yama Shabbos Lekad Shai Keep Shabbos." In its ultimate original version, that pasuk was just one long stream of divine names, and that pasuk, that stream of divine names, which is Elokus, that ultimately is the pasuk that's that 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 is the the light of God that's in, that's contained in that pasuk. As the Pasuk makes it all the way down here to planet Earth, it now takes on the reading of Keep Shabbos. And the final reading of that Pasuk indicates that the life force behind that Pasuk, which is the divine names of that Pasuk, is only going to enliven, is only going to enliven an environment which fits with the final version of that Pasuk, which is Keep Shabbos. What Rabbi Nachman is introducing us is that the, since ultimately that version of Zachar Siyam Meshav Slekadshay is only the final stage of that pasuk, but in earlier versions that reading is not set in stone, then there are ways to combine the pasuk to literally, to literally create the opposite meaning, where instead of the pasuk being a source of light and a source of energy, only to situations of keeping Shabbos, that same Pasa could also be realigned as a Pasa that's giving life to the opposite of keeping Shabbos. And so any situation, Rabbi Nachman says, that a person finds themselves in is being enlivened by a Pasa in Chumash. Either it's being enlivened by the final version of that Pasa, 
if you're in a, in a version of reality, in a particular space in reality that fits with that final version, or it's being enlivened by a, uh, by a more sublime, by a higher level of that Pasuk, which is not being broken down to those specific, to the, to the way that we read it right now. So let's see inside how he says this. <clears throat> Again, the, the fourth paragraph. Again, the Torah is the life force of all things. Nimsa. Which means that in all, in all thoughts, words, and actions, even of sin, it means the Torah must be, there, there must be a Pasuk enlivening that situation. There must be a Pasuk that is the essence of that particular environment. And, and, and as long as, there could be a Pusik that fits with that particular environment. That's what's sustaining that environment. So the question is, how could you possibly find a Pusik that is the environment of sin? Every Pusik is telling you not to sin. Every Pusik is telling you what, what you're supposed to be doing. So if you find yourself in, an, in, in a situation where you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, and yet you, you are existing, so it must be that there's a Pusik sustaining that situation. What Pasuk could be sustaining the situation of not keeping Shabbos? The answer is the same Pasuk that says to keep Shabbos, if you, those letters that are malleable in, in, high, in higher levels, in a higher levels than the, the way the Pasuk reads now, the Pasuk is not broken, broken down the way it is now. And in those higher <laughs> levels, the Pasukim, those letters can be rearranged in all sorts of different ways. And, and the ultimate life force that's sustaining that particular environment of the opposite of, of keeping Shabbos is the same Pasuk as Zechon Siyom HaShas but higher versions, more primordial versions of that Pasuk. The primordial version of the Pasuk Zechon Siyom HaShas which is basically a long stream of divine names, which is not broken down in a way that says Zechon Siyom HaShas that primordial version of that Pasuk is able to be the life force of an environment which is the opposite of Shabbos. Well, that, <laughs> there you go. Those, I told you. Those not words are, are they're not the same primordial and higher. So is it more primordial so we're gonna get to, we're than gonna, it is higher? We're higher gonna get to in that. terms of Kedusha? We're going to get that. H- higher in terms of primordial. <clears throat> primordial. But we're going to see. It's not Ratz and Hashem. We're going to bring it. We're going to get it. Huh? It's like cookie dough batter. It's like cookie dough batter. Yeah, it's, it's like cookie, cookie dough it's like batter. It's not really edible. It's good. It, well, it's, we're going we're gonna, to, we're going to, I don't know if we're going to get that, but we're going to see. It's, 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 we're going to get there. Let's get there slowly, slowly, slowly. Let's take a look. Let's, let's read inside. Again, fourth paragraph. Achshu Behelm, fine. Ki over v'shan and nas like hetter. So Rabbi Nachman quotes the pasuk. Ki over v'shan and nas like hetter. When a person sins and they repeat it again, it becomes like a hetter, right? It becomes nas like hetter. The Gemara says famously, meaning on a simple level, means you become used to it, so you don't uh, you don't even realize that you're doing anything wrong. The Haini, this is what he says, and this is and this and this is what happens. Shaidei haveris. When a person is doing an haver chas v'shan, who mahapech diver lekim chayim, you are automatically forcing. Forcing that pasuk to 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 ascend to a more primordial version of itself, where it no longer needs, where it no longer is is being forced into that specific tzeiruf, uh, that 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 specific combination of. And, and uh, arrangement of letters, which is read only as Zohar Yom by a Jew being in a position where, God forbid, they're not following that Pasuk, that Pasuk, which is, let, let, let's, let, let, me, let me explain. When a person is, is, is presented a <coughs> test of keeping Shabbos, let's give that as an example, we've been talking about Shabbos. You're in, you're in a matziv of where now there's a possibility of Shmir Shabbos. That means that the environment that you're in is the universe of Zohar Siyam That's the environment that you're in right now. That's why. Why is it that all of a sudden now this guy is tempted with, with a specific Nisayin? Why is it that this moment this guy has any sign of uh, Shatnas? Like what happened now? What, like what's, what's going on over there? The answer is that at that moment when you're confronting a Nisayin of, of Shatnas, that means that you are now entering a universe that's being sustained, that the bedrock of that universe is Loisil Shatnas. 
That, that's the universe that you're in right now. But now you have a test. The test is, are you going to allow the life force of that universe that you're in, are you going to allow the life force of that universe to be the final stage of that Pasuk, of Loi, Silva, Shatnas? And the only way to do that is by not putting on Shatnas. And then the universe that you're in is allowed to be in its final destination, in its final version, which is Loi, Silva, Shatnas. Or, God forbid, mm-hmm. a Jew does not, does not stand to that Nisayin, is not a Nisayin. He succumbs to the Eight Sahara and wears Shatnas, God forbid, so, but the universe that he's in is still the universe of Lysil Vashanas. And the universe didn't just dissipate. So what happens? The answer is, what now is sustaining that universe is the same Pasuk of Lysil Vashanas, but not the final version of that Pasuk. Now, this, the, the Chiyas, the Torah, the Pasuk that's sustaining that universe is the same Pasuk of Lysil Vashanas, but in its primordial state. And the Pasuk of Lysil Vashanas in its primordial state doesn't read Lysil Vashanas. The primordial state of that Pasuk of Silva Shadness is just a stream of divine names, which is, an, which is a reading which is able to sustain within itself wearing Shadness and not wearing Shadness. So nothing is, you, you are not able to change the fabric of the universe that you're put into. You are in a universe right now of Loi Silva Shadness. The next moment you're in a universe of, of uh, the Gisa Bayon Valayla, if, if the Nisayin is to open a safe or not. The next moment you're in, this, you're in a universe of Zohar Siyam Hashem We're constantly going from Pasuk to Pasuk to Pasuk. And the nature of the Nisayin is not whether or not I'm going to abandon the Pasuk in this, uh, of my life right now. You can't do that. That's the universe that you're put in. The Nisayin is, am I going to allow the Pasuk that is the battery system of this universe that I'm in right now, am I going to allow it to be its final version of Zorcha Siyam HaZakadshay, of Leisil Bashadnes, of Agisa B'Yam Valayla, or am I going to give in to my Yitzhara, thus forcing the Pasuk of this universe to ascend and to retreat to its primordial state. Now, when, when, I'm sorry, I'm going to get to you in a second, but here's the Nakuda. It might seem that that's a good thing. Why should I, so, right? Well, if, I, if by doing, doing an Avera, I am forcing this Pasuk, that's the bedrock of this universe right now, that I'm in right now, to retreat to its primordial state, well, Chayra, that's pretty good, right? Doesn't the Pasuk want to go back to where it comes from? The answer is no. The answer is no. The Ratzon Hashem is perfect. The Ratzon of the Rabbi Nishalom is for the Pasuk to say, Zohar es Yom But it is true. In order for it to, to get to that final destination, it has to make its way from God all the way down to Zachar Siyam HaShavah And along the way, there's alternate versions of that Pasuk. But the Ratzon Hashem is for it to be Zachar Siyam HaShavah Let me give you an example. Let's say you have a, a, a mathematician. You have Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein wakes up in the morning with a cheshek to give over a shir. Right? He has a cheshek to give over a shir. Now, the only shear that he's able to give of mathematics, based on the Talmudian that he has, is, for, for Albert Einstein, for, you know, for his madrega, a very dumbed-down version of, of a concept that he has in his head on a very high level. So what he has to do is think of something, whatever that, that shear is that he wants to give over to the Talmudian, he has to think of that idea on his level, and then bring it down, and more levushim, more mishalim, more constriction, all the way, all the way, all the way, till eventually it, it gets to a format where the Talmudim are able to understand what he's talking about. So, when you look at that process of moving from the, the mathematical idea as it exists in Albert Einstein's head, to all the way where it gets down to the Talmudim's head, you would think, well, which, which is a deeper level? What's a higher level of mathematics? Certainly, as the concept exists by Albert Einstein's head. But what makes Albert Einstein happy? What brings, what is, what is the Iker Rutzen of Albert Einstein? For him to think about the mathematical lecture or for him to be able to eventually get that lecture into his Talmudim's head? The Rutzen of Albert Einstein is when the shear is constricted to the point of where the Talmudim are able to process it. Even though for, to get to that place, it has to start off as a much higher level. 
This is the this is the irony and this is the paradoxical reality of Torah. It is true for Torah to make its way all the way down to our final version, which is Zacher as Yoy Mashab Zakatsha. It has to travel from a much higher level of divine names, which contains within it all sorts of different combinations, and that higher dimension of primordial Torah can be the bedrock for all to, for all sorts of environments that are connected to light of Shabbos and even anti-Shabbos. But what is the Ratz in Hashem? When the Rabbani Shalom even began this whole idea of thinking of Torah, even on his level, why is he doing this? Ultimately to get to Zachar Siyam HaShaz So So let's say you have a person that, like, he's building a house, right? Now in order to build a house, this is a classic example, right? In the you guys building a house. In order to build a house, it starts off very complicated. Engineers, People go to school for years to figure out how to make a blueprint to build a house, and then you have a contractor, all sorts of complicated stuff, right? Until eventually, eventually, it gets down to something very simple, where a guy is able to come home and, you know, turn on the barbecue in his backyard and throw on a steak. So, so what's, what's more sophisticated? The, the engineers and, the, and, and, the, uh, and those guys working on blueprints... Or the guy at the very, very end, like, you know, I hate to say it, like, like flushing the toilet and everything works. Like, what's, what's more sophisticated? The guy that, the, pl- the person that's creating the plumbing system or Lomaisa using the plumber? Of course, what's more sophisticated is the guy making the plumbing system. But what's the tachlis? The tachlis is, what gives the plumber more hana when he's sitting and calculating and figuring out how the plumbing should work? Or when he does all of it and he, and he flushes the toilet and the taco works? That is where the rut... The Iker Gili of Tanug comes when it gets down to the bottom line. So the same thing is with Torah. What does God want? What God wants is the final version of Zechus Yom HaShaz But in order to get from God to the final version of Zechus Yom HaShaz there's all sorts of higher versions of that possible. So when you're in a situation of Nisayan, and you're now in the universe of Zechus Yom HaShaz you have a choice. Am I going to live in this moment as God, and, and to bring God ultimate pleasure, and the way I bring pleasure to God is by what? Is by allowing this universe to be chant, to be to be enlivened by the final version of this Pasuk, namely, to keep Shabbos, Zohar Siyam HaShaz or, God forbid, I don't live up to that Nisayan, and I force that Pasuk to ascend to its primordial state, so the Pasuk is on a higher level, but God is not having Tanakh. And that's the difference between a tzaddik and a person that's not a tzaddik. A tzaddik is living according to the final version of the Pasuk, which in truth is a lower level than what that Pasuk means for a person that's not a tzaddik. So the guy, so two people are in a universe of Zohar Siyam HaShah One person is keeping Shabbos, and the version of that Pasuk in his world is the final stage, Zohar Siyam HaShah The guy that's, and then they have another, his neighbor is not keeping Shabbos. He's also in the universe of Zohar Siyam HaShah but the Pasuk that's enlivening his universe is the primordial version of that Pasuk. So whose Pasuk is deeper? The not Tzadik, the, the Rasha, the Mechal Shabbos, his Pasuk is Taka deeper. But who's giving God more pleasure? Who's sustaining the system? Who's motivating God to even begin this whole process? Who's doing the Ikar Ratzin Hashem? Certainly the Tzadik. But this is, the, and, and, and again, this is the key of Ishmael Tzichasidus. If you want to convince the, the guy that's not keeping Shabbos to bring him to the world of Shabbos, what you have to do, according to Ishmael, is what? Is to reveal to him that he is in the world of Shabbos. He's as deeply connected to the world of Zohar Siyam HaShavos HaKadshay as the Shemr Shabbos Tikiyid. The only difference between the two of them is what version of that Pasuk are you living with? Are you living with a version of that Pasuk that makes God happy? Or are you living with a version of that Pasuk that doesn't make God happy yet? But in terms of your connection to Shabbos, of course you're connected to Shabbos. That's the universe you live in. So, you're, you're, so a person is a Jew, that's Hastara Shabbatai Hastara. He not only doesn't know that, he doesn't even know he doesn't know that Shabbos. So, the, so what's the Eitzah? So we're not going to say the Eitzah is to reveal to him this truth, which is, of, of, co- of course you're in Shabbos. There's no such thing as a Jew that's not in Shabbos universe. Of course you're in Shabbos universe. The question is, uh, is the Pasuk 
of Shabbos that's enlivening your universe, the final stage of the Pasuk, the final reading of the Pasuk, or is it still in its primordial state? But either way, you're in the universe. This is how, you're, this is how you wake that Jew up, by revealing to him that even in Hester Shabbatai Hester Shabbatai Hester, you're still in the same Pasuk as Zachar Siyam You're just in higher versions of it. Now, higher doesn't mean, doesn't mean, uh, doesn't mean more pleasurable to God. It doesn't mean more, doesn't mean more connected to Ratzon. The Ratzon of Hashem and the Tanakh of the Rabbani Shalom is triggered and unleashed by Dafka, the final version. But the primordial versions are necessary to eventually get to the final version. And they're higher in terms of being more sophisticated, just like the idea in Einstein's brain. But it's not the Ikertanik, it's not the Ikerotzi. It's not as much shutfus with exactly. that higher level. It's, right. it's just in Einstein's brain. Exactly, and the Talmudin don't feel it. Right. And this is the ultimate thing. What gives their abundance some pleasure is us to experience Shabbos. The guy that's the Michal Shabbos... And his version of that Pasuk in the, is the primordial state of that Pasuk. He is not enjoying Shabbos. He doesn't have Chant and Kogol. He doesn't have a, 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 a Gishmak a Davening. He's not in, he doesn't feel, the, because that final version of Zohar Siyam and is the only version that you can read. So, so unless you're living in that version, you're not feeling Shabbos. And the Rabbanu Shalom wants you to feel Shabbos. He, the Rabbanu Shalom enjoys that Pasuk only when you enjoy that Pasuk. So not only so this two, when a person is not living that final version, two things are, are being left out. First of all, you're not enjoying the pasuk, and the rebbeinu was not enjoying that pasuk. But are you still connected to that pasuk? Of course you are. Otherwise, you wouldn't exist in that universe. So everything is being enlivened by Tyra. The question is the primordial state of Tyra or the final version of Tyra. And what's and you need tzaddikim to shed the primordial version of Torah, that light that I mentioned for the Balsham, which is primordial. The the the, the Ishbitzer, is is the, his inyan, you know, is the, the Ishbitzer is 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 revealing to the world what Torah looks like in its primordial state. And you know what it looks like? It looks like the exact opposite of the way it reads to us. Every single time that you see a Jew that's not living up to a particular Pasuk, the Ishbitzer would tell you that you should know that Pasuk is that Jew is living that Pasuk just in the opposite version. Not making God happy, and that's the difference between a, between a tzaddik and a rasha. Not whether they're connected to the pasuk, or whether they're making God happy with that pasuk. Is that the level described by the pasuk? In tzedak to my titulai? Yeah, in tzedak to my titulai means exactly, exactly, because ultimately it's it's still that same pasuk in terms of rotsan and tanuk. It's not the same. In the yeah. Einstein mushal, I'm going to get to you. I haven't forgotten. I forgot. In the Einstein mushal, Einstein wouldn't have thought the opposite of his final version in his thought process. So why, why would it be necessary? Why part of the process was a mukhaq that Hashem had to include the opposite of the final version? That's that something that we're going to see over the course of the coming weeks in Israel. So why it's like that? And what, 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 that? That's a good question, and that's something that we're going to have to investigate further. But this is just the general idea first, just the foundational idea. And just a, a part two to that yeah. question. Why is it mukhaq that the opposite of... Keep it, that the that not keeping Shabbos is in the primordial version of the mm-hmm. Shabbos pasuk. It could be in the primordial version of any other pasuk too. Why not? Meaning, once you get above, because that's the universe that you're in. It's just the, a shameless like the it's from a, so it can mean it can mean anything. So why can't it be Shabbos is actually because that's not the, the, the because again the, the the world is being created from the Torah. So if you are in a matzav of where the avoid of this moment is Shabbos, whether you are fulfilling that avoid or rebelling against that avoid, that's the Indian that you're revol- that that's the that's the that's the nucleus throughout that 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 you're revolving around. The theme. The concept of that's the theme of the universe that you're in. Thing that's in the final version that we're experiencing. Awesome. Cool. So, so either, you're you're or, either you're doing it, either you're fulfilling ruts, either you are being makabel on yourself ruts malchus or you're throwing off of yourself malchus But either way, the choice that you're making is revolving around that aspect of malchus So, and that aspect of malchus is the essence of that universe that's the that's the life force of that universe and so now the question is am i accepting it or am i rebelling against it but i'm doing something but what i'm doing is revolving around that nakuda i'm either putting on tzitzis or i'm taking off my tzitzis but it's about tzitzis 
So, and that universe is, a universe that I'm in at that moment, if it's an Nisayan of Tzitzis, that universe is being sustained by the Pasuk of, you know, Vaslan Tzitzis al Khan Big Day. So either I am living up to that standard, and I'm being makabal on myself, Omal Shemayim, and then the Pasuk sustaining that moment is red, Vaslan Tzitzis al Khan Big Day, and then I feel it, and the Rabbanu Shalom feels it, and then I'm a Tzaddik, and, and the Rabbanu Shalom created the world for the Tzaddik. The Rabbani Shem created the world for the tzaddik. The Rabbani Shem only even began this whole idea of having a primordial Torah, ultimately because there's going to be a Jew that lives up to the final version of it. But, but ultimately, a Jew that's not living up to it is just connecting himself to the primordial version of that Torah. Which is still the Ratzel. It's higher, it's, it's but it's not the Pneumius Ratzel. Right. In Chesidus, the way it's... This is, this, is a, this, is a good, this is a good lesson to know. We're just nomenclature. In Chesidus, you'll find there's a difference between Chitzonius Haratzin and Pneumius Haratzin. If a guy... If I'm sitting at... The classic example from the Zara already is if I'm sitting at the dining room table, right? And I'm... And I'm uh, I have guests, right? There's, I have guests at the table and I have a, a pet dog. It's not even my pet dog. My, my guest brought a dog, right? So now I'm the ball bus. I have a responsibility of feeding my guests and feeding my guest dog. So to my guests, and I'm going to give everyone. To my guests, I give them a piece of steak. And to the dog, I, give them a, I throw them a bone. But there's a difference between how I give it. To the, my guests, my human guests, I'm giving pun in the pun. To my, to the, the, the dog, it's shoddy basar kaspe. I'm throwing him a bone behind my shoulder. I'm giving either way. And that means if I'm doing it, it means I want to do it. So obviously, yes, I want to give my guests, and I guess I want to give the dog also. Pnimi Yisaratzin is to my guest. Chitzayin Yisaratzin is to the dog. So the Rabbani Shalom, yes, wants there to be a primordial version of that Pasuk. Why? Only because that's the necessary step to eventually get to the final version of the Pasuk. But the final version of the Pasuk is Pnimi Yisaratzin. The primordial version of the Pasuk is Chitzayin Yisaratzin. So the, the, the Tzaddik is connect to the final version, but ultimately the final version is Pnimi Yisaratzin Yisaratzin. The Russia is connected to the primordial version of the Pasuk, but that's only Chitzan Yisrael. This is the deeper meaning of the famous Medrash that the many Mepharshim believed was, has to be taken out from the Medrash, because they, you know, the Medrash says that the Rabbani Shalom created the way that there's uh, the ways of Tzaddikim and there's the ways of the Rishayim. And says the Medrash, and I don't know which way God wants. So Kamash the Pasuk says, God saw the light that it was good. Ah, oh, that's a reference to the ways of the Tzaddikim. Ask them the Farshim, there's a Havamina that the Rabbani Shalom wants the ways of the Rishayim? The answer is, maybe, maybe. Because according to what we're saying, the ways of the Rishayim is the pre-mortal version of that puzzle. That's higher. The Teretz is, that's not Pneumius Ritzan Yisbarach. That's Chitzan Ritzan Yisbarach. This is the difference between Ishbitz and Kotsk. You know, so it's interesting. The, 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 the Kotsk or his name, it's very late, I'm sorry. The, if anyone has to go, don't worry about it. The Ishbitzer's name, uh, the, or the Kutzker's name was Mendel. Mendel is a name that's always associated with Mashiach ben David. Mashiach ben David means final destination. The Ishbitzer's name was Mordechai Yosef, which is a name that's always associated with Mashiach ben Yosef, which is pre, pre-final destination. Because that's the sight of here. The Kutzker is black and white, Emes, Emes, final version of the Apostle. That is the final destination. That's the tzaddik. That's that's the tachlis. That's primis ritzanius bar. But the Ishbitzer comes to the world to shed light on what, on the primordial version of the pasuk, waking those Jews that are stuck in Hester Shabbatai Hester, showing that they're just as connected to the pasuk as the tzaddik, albeit not in primis haratzim, but in chitzanius haratzim. This is why. Let's go back. This is why the Ishbitzer was motivated to break himself off. Now take a look, you know, before we get to that, <clears throat> one second, I'm sorry. So the, if you take a look at, um, at the piece uh, in Rabbi Nachman, let's, uh, we'll, we'll, let's go, because it's just, just Marik. Let's do it. You see, you see it by the paragraph, Vizet Perish? Yeah. Vizet yeah. Perish, it says in, in Megil Sester. Uvakol yoyim v'yoyim mordechai mishal v'fnei chatzar beis hanoshim, l'das eshloim ester, umal yoyasaba. Right? So it's one of the Pesach says, that Mordechai every single day would go, he would walk, pace, back and forth between the, the, the courtyard of the women to know what's going on with Esther and to figure out what happened. Yeah, that's a possible. 
So listen how the, how Rabbi Nachman touches the pasuk based on everything we said before. And the, remember the name Mordechai, which is the Ishbitzer's name, Mordechai Yosef. Mordechai is Evachinas Malchus. And the earlier the context of that piece, he explains that the name Mordechai is related to the concept of a melech. The word Mordechai comes from the word Mar, which means master. Mordechai, Rabbi Nachman explains, is a name that's indicative of someone in the position of needing of 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 an, someone in a position where he has the responsibility of bringing Yidin into Yiddishkeit, uh, to bring people under the Malchus of Hashem, uh, the, the Mechiach in the Lashon of Rabbi Nachman, the Mashpia. That's what Mordechai means. Ubekol yoyim v'yoyim. And says the Pasuk like this, every single day, Sebechinas Torah. The word kol, Ubekol yoyim v'yoyim is reference to Torah, that the Tzaddik, that the Mordechai, has to give over to those Yidin that are outside of the Malchus. Mm-hmm. Okay, the, word, the reason why Torah is compared to Bukol Yom V'yom because every single day, every single moment is enlivened by a particular Pasuk in Chomish, right? That's what we've been talking about. Bukol Yom V'yom, Mordechai. Every, Mordechai has responsibility of revealing the Torah behind every single moment of existence. She also says Bukol Yom V'yom, right? So Torah, exactly, that's what Torah is, right? Then the Pasik says, Mordechai is walking where? The Fne Chatzar Beis Anosh, right? So he says like this Chatzar is a courtyard, Bayas is a house. One's on the outside, one's on the inside. Sebechin is Chitzonius Uprimius, Hainu, meaning Machshavis Vidiburim. It means that Mordechai is responsible to reveal the Torah that's giving life to all things that are on the outside, like actions, which is compared to a courtyard. And he's also responsible to reveal the Torah that's enlivening all hidden things, like thoughts, that's compared to the house on the inside. And that's what Mordechai is here to reveal. That the Rabbani Shalom is enlivening, Torah is enlivening all these things. But here's the kicker. Chatzar base Hanoshem. The word Noshem comes from the word Menashe, which means to forget. But Mordechai, the, 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 the Mashpia, is responsible to reveal that Torah is not only the sustaining force behind good thoughts and good actions, but it's also the force behind all thoughts and all actions that until now you thought have been forgotten by God and are outside of God's universe. Even those places, Mordechai, Mishalech, Lefnei Chatzar, Beis Hanoshem. So he says like this, even the thoughts and actions of those Jews that think of themselves as being far from the Rabbani Shalom, that even that's a place that Mordechai has to bring Torah to. The word Nashim comes to the word to forget, it also comes to the word like Gid Hanasha, something that has been moved, something that's been dislocated. Those Jews, those thoughts, those words, those actions, that until now the person thinks have been dislocated from Tyra, Mordechai comes and reveals, that those moments and those actions that until now have been thought of as being detached from Tyra, those moments and actions are also being enlivened by Tyra. And Mordechai, through this, is able to be mechazik and to bring those Jews back by revealing to them that they never went away. That's the Nakuda. He reveals them that they never went away. Through, this, through Mordechai, a person gets to this awareness. That what? It's revealed this, that what? That even in the, in the hidden within the hidden, that it's, it, it's all Tyre. It always was Tyre. It was just a primordial version of Tyre. And you're responsible, your responsibility is just to live up to the final version of that Pasuk. But not to now enter into that. You've always been living in that Pasuk. The Zel, that's the meaning, Ladas as Shalom Esther. To reveal the knowledge that even Esther, which is concealment, Shalom, it's in a, it's in a state of peace. It's you, You've never left the, the place of the king. That's the meaning. To know what happened to her. It means that you're turning Esther into what? Into Ma. The word Ma is a reference to Tyre. Like the child in, in the Seder night asks. Uma ye asaba. Mordechai turns Esther into Ma. Mordechai reveals that Esther is the place of Esther upon him is this, is Ma. It's also Tyra. It's also Maha Edis. The question is, I just don't know what this Pasik means. I can't read it because it's not it's not the final version of it. So Maha Edis Vachuk Meshbatama. I don't know what this Pasik means. I can't read it, but it's still a Pasik. 
It's still a puzzle. Okay, let's go back to that story. Now we're gonna mamish. I'm so sorry. It's mamish light, but let's let's get, let's get to the, the, the punchline over here. That puzzle, that story. Dafka Simchas Tyra. Okay, in Maramukah number three, this is a piece from the Pistei Sharim, a Talmud of the Vilna Gaon, from the base manager of the Vilna Gaon, and he writes the following thing: It's everything we're talking about, but in the final, in in, in this in a particular point. The Rebbeinu runs the world, and again, I'm just going to touch you the way we've been saying it. There are two versions of every pasuk, based on what we've been talking about. Vonaga klolis, vonaga pratis. Okay, hanhaga klolis, one hanhaga, what we'll call the primordial version of Tyra, and on that version, who bechina ein hefresh bein avoid lavoid. That's a pre, the primordial version of a pasuk. It does not you cannot discern what's right, what's wrong. Because whatever you're doing, you're contained in that primordial version of that puzzle. There is no up, there is no down, there is no right, there is no wrong. It's all equal. In that primordial version of Zohar Siyam Hashaz Lekadshah, in that primordial version, it, 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 it says in that primordial version to keep Shabbos, and it also says not to keep Shabbos. It's all in that primordial version. You can't read it. There's no up, there's no down. Vashef and Ishpilakulam. And from that primordial version of Tyra, the energy that's being sustained by Tyra goes to everyone. It goes to every single person in that environment, whether you're living up to Shabbos or not. Sustaining everyone. This version, this Taira, is being described by a circle. Because a circle is what? There's no up, there's no down, there's no right, there's no equidistant. Everything is even. Everything is even. However, says the Mishchei Sharm, there's another version of the Pasuk, which is the final version. What's the final version? Not eagle, it's not a circle. The final version is what's called Yoisher. So he says like this, the, the, the next line, Ubechina Beis, the second version, Nikris Yoisher. It's called straight, a straight line where there's up and there's down. There's feet. There's feet. The difference between a circle and a straight line in the human being is the Bechina feet. Feet is, means that you're standing straight, right? A circle, a circle has no feet. Sheker ain't la regline, right? Lies, Sheker doesn't have any feet. Why? Because feet means a, a clear a clear stance. Feet means a clear direction. There's up and there's down. Sheker is a circle. Sheker is circular, right? Maybe it's like this, maybe it's like that. Today it's like this, today's like that. It's a Sheker. So there's spine. Huh? There's, spine. there's no spine, right? Spineless. So it's Sheker, ain't the line. It's just going on a Gal Gal So let's go back to the Yishritza. The Ishritzer's Indian is to reveal the primordial version of Tyra in comparison to the final version of Tyra that the, Ish- that the Kutzker embodies, which means, in another sense, mm-hmm. that the Ishritzer is about revealing the circular nature of Tyra, whereas Kutzk is about revealing the linear version of Tyra. Therefore, the <coughs> revelation of Kutzk, the time where Bashkar HaPratis was determined that it's time for him to break off and to become his own chaz, his own rabbi, was dafka by Simchas Tar by Hakafas. What's Hakafas? Circle, a circle. Da- Yidin dancing in a circle around the tire which is held upright. So of course, the Iker Tachlis and the Pnimius Ritzani Sparach is the final version of Tyra, which has an up and has a down. And that's the person standing in the middle holding the tire indirect. But Lamaisa, the primordial version of Tyra, is also being celebrated by the circles. And that's what the Kutzker, that's what the, the Kutzker's, in, that's what the Kutzker during that Hakafa comes and grabs the Sefer Torah from the middle. Because ultimately the middle of that circle is the embodiment of the Kutzker. But the circle itself is the Ishmitzer. And therefore Davka, it was revealed to him to break off by him putting on his left shoe first. Left always means weaker, right? By him, Ba'ashkach HaPrat is putting on his left shoe first, that means it was Niskalat him that it's now time to reveal the Indian of circles and and to and to reveal the weakness of the feet, to weaken the bechin of the foot, and to move out of that place and to reveal the true the strength of a feetless circle. You understand? That's what the that's what the Ishbitzer means. The Ishbitzer means the embodiment of a version of Torah that feel that's the opposite of, of feet. And that that's exactly what was Nisgalat him to break off and to become his own rebbe. Dafka when he made a mistake. But he made a mistake by putting on his left shoe first. When there was a begam, when there was a revelation of there being something missing in the Torah when it's only that linear version of it. There needs to be a tzaddik that's embodying the circular version of it to enliven and to bring to bring those yidden that are a star, a star, to bring them back 
into the fold and ultimately get them to become Katsuch Chesidim. That's the point, to get to Emes, to get to Emes. But in order to get to that Emes, you have to first reveal to them that they've always been in that world of Emes to begin with. That's what Katsuch is. Let's go back to the very beginning. I almost forgot, but Sal and Moshe, yeah? Okay. It's, uh, okay. The, Mishkan, the Mishkan is the circle. You understand? Mishkan is the circle. The Mishkan is, it's the surrounding environment in which it's the Hakafa. The Mishkan is the Hakafa, and the Kalim is the Tzaddik standing in the middle with up and down, linear. That's the difference between the Kalim and the Mishkan. When the Rabbani Shalom talks to Maishu Rabbeinu, the Rabbani Shalom is revealing to Maishu Rabbeinu Parshas Chuma what Pnimius Ritzanius Baruch is. Pnimius Haratzen, what the Rabbani Shalom really wants is Tzaddik. What the Rabbani Shalom really wants is the final version of Tyra. And therefore in Parshas Chuma, the Rabbani Shalom says, Kalim, and then, in order to have Kalim, in order to have the final version, I have to come up with a, with a primordial version. Tachlis is that final puzzle. And Moshe Rabbeinu, who's the Tzaddik, Moshe Rabbeinu, who, who's the Chiddush of Moshe Rabbeinu, is that he gives us the final version of Psukim. So he tells Betzalel, Kalim, and then Mishka. But the Chiddush of Betzalel is that, as Chazal say, he knew, Letzarif ben Nivrish Maivarts. He knew that the world that is created, he knew how it was, how it was put together from that divine stream of names. Betzal understood the Chiddush and what's needed to reveal to the world how the, the, the circle, he, needed, he was the Ishbitzer, he needed to reveal the significance of the Tzirufi Shemus, of the divine names, giving room to all Jews, Jews that live up to the standard of the Aaron and Jews that don't live up to the standard of the Aaron to, to embody the, the concept of the Mishkan. And when you have that Mishkan, the circle, then you could bring everyone to, that, to the Tzadik. So Betzal therefore says to Maishu Rabbeinu, maybe the Mishkan first, that's the way of the world. That's the way of the world, huh? So why is it Shem? Because the whole Indian is Shem. The whole Indian of, 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 the, of the circles, the whole Indian of, of the pre-mortal version of Torah is that it's, it, it, there is no certainty. It's a circle. That, that the nature of it is that there is no definitive truth. There is no definitive truth. What does the Pasuk say? I'm not sure. It could say anything. That's the magic only I don't know. But to get the Zohar Siyam Hashem it has to have premortal versions which are open-ended in what the Pasuk means. And this is all Purim. This is all Purim. What's the name of The whole thing of Purim is Vahapich. The whole thing of Purim is, is circles. The whole story is a circle. The end of the story of Purim, you get back to the beginning that we're, we're still by Achish Verish. Like what happened exactly? It's all one big circle. Because that, that, but that's the Simchas Purim. That's the Simchas Purim is, is a revelation that Yidin were being Nana Misudas Achish Verish and somehow they're being rewarded for it as if they're doing a mitzvah. How, how is it that at the same Suda, which we're doing in Avera, that's motivating a decree against the Jewish people, is also the same Suda that we're being zaychet to have Esther Amalka being put in her place to, re, to reveal the second base of English. How is the Avera also a mitzvah? Because of Ishmael, because of the circle. That's exactly what Simchas Purim is. Simchas, Simchas Purim will never be bottled because the circle never ends. The circle never ends. No, okay, it's not the talk about it. It's a shambled ground.